I want to thank everybody for coming out today. Um, my name is Aaron Nichols. I'm the president and uh, commander of the Gulf Coast Rangers uh, Citizens Militia here in South Mississippi. I've been married for eight years and uh, my wife and I have three children. We live in Loosedale, Mississippi. I'm a veteran of both the Marine Corps and the Mississippi Army National Guard where I served with uh, 10 years experience. I served in uh, Fallujah, Iraq in 2004 and 2005 as a Marine Infantry Squad leader. Currently a train master for a short line railroad in South Mississippi in Moss Point. I didn't get involved in politics until 2006 when I was discharged from the Marine Corps. And in 2008, the uh, second time I was eligible to vote in the presidential election, I uh, supported it Senator John McCain. It was at this time that my, my interest in politics began to blossom. I began to find out who I was, both politically and ideologically. I also began to learn about secular progressivism and liberalism in America. I would also go on to find out the differences between true conservatism and the establishment. This was the birth of the Tea Party movement. At this time, Barack Obama was unknown by the majority of Americans. He was well liked by the majority of black Americans and white college millennials. He had a great personality and he could speak well. I quickly discovered that Barack Obama was the most presidential, most uh, liberal presidential candidate in U.S. history. He had many connections with uh, communists beginning at an early age. So I had to find out who this man was. So I decided to read his book, Dreams from My Father. And I was blown away by what I would read in this book. One quote stated, To avoid being mistaken for a sellout, I chose my friends carefully. The more politically active black students, the foreign students, the Chicanos, the Marxist professors, the punk rock perform performance poets. The content of this book only worsened as Mr. Obama painted his 20 year tenure in the racist church of Jeremiah Wright. The same church that gave Michael Flager a standing ovation when he said that Hillary Clinton's defeat left a whole lot of white people crying. This, along with a Social Achievement Award to Louis Farrakhan, is what Mr. Obama's church calls Christianity. As we all know, Barack Hussein Obama became the 44th President of the United States of America and has since been re-elected to a second term. Under this administration, we have increased the national debt by over $7.5 trillion. They've given us Obamacare. They've intentionally refused to enforce federal immigration laws. We've had Operation Fast and Furious, a government-sponsored gun running scheme, alienated and isolated our strongest ally in the Middle East, Israel. We've endured our first ever credit downgrade due to poor economic policies. We violated the Constitution by authorizing assassinations and drone strikes abroad on U.S. citizens without due process. When, st when states voted to enforce the federal immigration laws, the federal government refused to enforce them, and they sued these states. They have used Obamacare as a pretext to greatly increase the size and power of the IRS. They've used the IRS to harass conservative businesses. After Nadal Hassan killed 13 people at Fort, Fort Hood while shouting Allahu Akbar as to become a martyr for Islam, the Obama administration refused to classify this as terrorism and instead deemed it merely workplace violence. Obama's Department of Homeland Security specifically warned that all Americans who are dedicated to a single issue, such as abortion or immigration, are potential terrorists, as are libertarian-minded voters who favor state or local authority over a centralized power. These right-wing extremists who hold political beliefs shared by the majority of Americans are deemed a greater threat than actual jihadists. This brings me to the topic I'm here to speak on today, the militia. But first I want to pose a few questions. Who is responsible for protecting the people and the Constitution against the tyrannical government? What was the Founders' intent behind the Second Amendment? The militia, contrary to the insistence of the media, is not an anti-government hate group. We're not a bunch of uneducated hillbillies, racists, rednecks, or extremists. We're not anti-government. We're pro-constitution, and we are the militia. 
Title 10, Section 311 defines militias all able-bodied males and females between the age of 17 and 45. There are two classes defined in this section, the organized militia and the unorganized militia. The Gulf Coast Rangers and our sister unit, the Citizens Militia of Mississippi, make up the unorganized militia. Why do we need a militia? What good can we do? Well, it's a militia that stops to help a stranded motorist who needs a hand chaining a flat tire. It's the militia who disrupts shootings, mass shootings, robberies, just by exercising the right to carry a firearm. But you're at, you, you say that's just normal people, but the militia is just normal people. Tinge Cox said, who are the militia? Are they not ourselves? Is it feared then that we shall turn arms, each man against his own bosom? Congress shall have no power to disarm the militia. Their swords and every other terrible implement of the soldier are the birthright of an American. The unlimited power of the sword is not in the hands of the federal or state governments, but where I trust in God it will ever remain, in the hands of the people. Thomas Jefferson said, And what country can preserve its liberties if its rulers are not warned from time to time that these people preserve the spirit of resistance? Let them take arms. The tree of liberty must be refreshed from time to time with the blood of patriots and tyrants. President John F. Kennedy said, Today we need a nation of men and men. Citizens are not only prepared to take arms, but citizens, who, but citizens who regard the preservation of freedom as the basic purpose of their daily life and who are willing to consciously work and sacrifice for that freedom. The Second Amendment states a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. The framers of our Constitution relied on the militia, the armed populace, for both national defense and restraint against government usurpation of power. The greatest fear that many Americans had during the founding era was that a standing army would enable the federal government to establish and enforce tyranny over the people. Thomas, Thomas Jefferson noted in 1803, None but an armed nation can dispense with a standing army. To keep ours armed and disciplined is at all times important. He later commented, We cannot be defended but by making every citizen a soldier, as the Greeks and Romans who had no standing army. It was understood that standing armies were dangerous to liberty and that it is necessary to find an alternative to them. Jefferson also said, no free man shall be debarred the use of arms. The strongest reason for the people to retain the right to keep and bear arms is as a last resort to protect themselves against tyranny and government. Alexander Hamilton, Federalist, number 28. When a government betrays the people by amassing too much power and becoming tyrannical, the people have no choice but to exercise their original right of self-defense to fight the government. James Madison, the father of the Bill of Rights, wrote in Federalist Number 16, the ultimate authority resides in the people, and that if the federal government got too powerful and overstepped its authority, then the people could develop plans of resistance and resort to arms. Some believe that our well-regulated militia means the state national guard, but our founders opposed anything but a small national military. Well-regulated refers to the well-trained, well-equipped and disciplined militia. The term well-regulated was in common use in 1791, and it was defined by the Oxford English Dictionary of the time as something calibrated correctly, functioning as expected. Over the past 60 years, the interpretation of the term well-regulated militia has come under fire from the Federal Court of Appeals and many lower court judges. Those judges have wrongly rule that the right to keep and bear arms doesn't apply to the individual, but have wrongly interpreted the militia to mean the state's National Guard. Guard units have two missions, to support the local communities during emergencies and natural disasters, and to supplement federal forces in war fighting. Given the complexity of modern weapons and tactics, the majority of guard training is focused on the federal mission. Accordingly, State military forces rely on the federal government for funding and equipment to maintain military readiness. This reliance, coupled with the fact that the president has the authority to place the guard under federal control at any time, 
disqualifies the guard as a militia. A militia is an independent force under its own leadership formed by constitutional state and local governments or the people. The right to form a militia and defend themselves from a tyrannical government or unconstitutional federal government remains the states and the peoples as expressed in the Second Amendment and not the federal military asset that is the National Guard. The words well regulated had a far different time the Second Amendment was written. In today's world, well, well regulated is associated with intense government regulation. At the time the Second Amendment was drafted, the term didn't need, need to be defined because colonial militias had existed for over 150 years. In colonial times, every adult male was required to join. It was their duty to report for service four to six times per year. They had their own muzzle, they had their own musket, their own bayonet, their own knapsack. The militia was, was well organized, well regulated, with a captain elected by popular vote, and each unit drafted a formal written covenant to be signed upon enlistment. Although the Constitution does give Congress the power to raise in support of a temporary army, the framers feared anything but a small national military. A standing army was dangerous. The overriding purpose of the Second Amendment, guaranteeing the right of the people to keep and bear arms, is not for hunting. It is to maintain a check on the federal government. A well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state meant the ultimate power must be in the hands of the people. The Second Amendment is very specific about this. It is the right of the people and not the states to keep and bear arms. In 2008, the Supreme Court confirmed this view in the District of Columbia v. Heller. Finding the right to keep and bear arms an individual right held by the people and not a collective right as had been wrongly interpreted by certain black robe supremacists. The High Courts concluded, Americans have an individual right to possess a firearm unconnected with the service of the militia and to use that arm for tr traditional lawful purposes such as self-defense within the home. This was a victory for our individual right to bear arms. But other portions of the same document contradict the true intention of the Second Amendment. The court stated, like most rights, the Second Amendment is not unlimited. It is not a right to carry any weapon whatsoever, in any manner whatsoever, and for whatever purpose. Clearly the controversy is not over. The Heller decision reads from both sides of the mouth, leaving the door wide open for mis misinterpretation. This leaves the door wide open for all kinds of restrictions and regulations on guns that could lead to tighter restrictions on the right to bear arms in America. The fact is, the more well-trained armed citizens there are in a community, the safer the, the population will be. Crime stats show cities with the strictest gun control laws have the highest crime rates per capita. With all that being said, there are no provisions in place for calling up the unorganized militia. So the Patriots, including myself, chartered the Gulf Coast Rangers and formed a, a, a leadership, formed leadership on December the 8th, 2012. In the beginning, we questioned to use the, whether to use the term militia or not, because there was a stigma attached to this word by the media and our government. We eventually learned the true meaning of the word militia. We knew that if we were going to be a legitimate group, that we'd have to get out in the public eye. We have organized our militia to cover certain geographical locations based on the residency of our membership. At no time will the militia take the law into their own hands, except for the preservation of oneself, his property, and his family. As the commander of the Gulf Coast Rangers, I fully recognize and submit to the law. We are established to provide evidence of corruption and tyranny in government. We are constantly monitoring our local governments to detect potential effects of Agenda 21. If you think Agenda 21 isn't real, you're wrong. The militia operates on the concept of command information communication. While I may be the commander, my job isn't to bar quarters. My job is to give information so each ranger can sort this information in his own conscience and decide which action to take. I'm not in command of people, but merely a commander in what's called a unity of command, so that one person reports to another person up and down a chain in an echelon of communication. 
This structure is used to, for dissemin disseminating information in an organized fashion. Those of us who have served in the military are familiar with the concept of command control communication. Basically, you're my soldier. I'm giving you an order and I expect you to carry it out. During the Revolutionary War, General Washington had a heck of a time when the militia would show up because the militia was not command controlled. If the militia assessed the battlefield and they decided it wasn't worth the fight, they went home. This is the same way the modern militia operates today. When the time comes for our unit to be forced into a ready status, we will defer to the lawful historic authority, which is the county sheriff. The county sheriff is indeed the commander of the local citizens militia. And when a situation erupts, the militia falls under the direct command of the county sheriff. It is very important that everyone understand the lawful historic role of our sheriffs. The sheriff's authority to enable posses at any time, but especially in times of emergency. We send an open invitation to all law enforcement present who would like to attend one of our monthly training events. What are we preparing for? An economic collapse? More government intrusion? We live in a surveillance state and our liberties are being stripped away on a daily basis. Today, the majority of Americans err on the side of false security and authoritarianism. They believe the lie that it is the government's job to take care of them. Meanwhile, our borders are imaginary lines and immigration laws are not being enforced. Terrorists have an open invitation to come into our country and terrorize the American people. The government has no right to overpower us. And we as the people hold our own fate and our own way of life. We're under the watchful eye of an ever increasingly tyrannical government. The NSA is watching our every move, but we have nothing to hide. Fortunately, inside of our military lies patriots just like ourselves. They are being told that their beliefs are un-American, extreme, unpatriotic. Why? Because they support the people. They took an oath to the Constitution. I stand here today to tell those that are asleep that you are the traitor. You're an American. Those standing idle while our rights are being stripped away, you have no place in this country. We must send a message reminding the people that we are not a democracy. Article 4, Section 4 of the Constitution states, The United States shall guarantee to every state in this union a Republican form of government, and it shall protect each of them against invasion and upon application of the legislature or the executive against domestic violence. Tell me if this sounds familiar. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, and with liberty and justice for all. The Tenth Amendment reads, The power is not delegated to the states by the Constitution, nor prohibited by it to the states, or reserved to the states respectively, or the people. There are countless laws that the government has passed that are a direct violation of our rights. Vaccination laws, laws restricting homeschooling, gun control laws, the suspension of habeas corpus and policy comitatus. We have a cultural war brewing in this country and most Americans do not even realize it. We have become too complacent. We have allowed tyrants to take control of our country. We must rise up while we have the means to do so and resist. This is a call to arms. We cannot wait until the government comes to our homes to take our weapons. The time to act is now. We must put all of our trust in the only name by which we can be saved. Yahushua HaMashiach, the King of all kings, the Lord of all lords, the judge of all judges, the glory of Israel, the light of the world, the foundation on which this country came into existence. Thank you, patriots. God bless the state of Mississippi, and God bless the United States of America. Simple for those.